As we try to grasp and describe the infinite nature of our universe, the vastness of space, and its origin in time, we use our minds, our thoughts, emotions, and our languages to convey these perceptions. It seems quite natural. But why do we use the finite to experience and define the infinite? Does the process of naming and isolating one piece of the whole ever allow us to know the whole, or just a whole lot of pieces? A flow consists of the following parts, the stamen, which consists of the anther and the filament, the pistol, which consists of the stigma, the style, and the ovary, the petal, the ovules, the sepal, and the pencil, a typical flower. But as we all know, the whole is more than merely the sum of its parts. The infinite nature, the absolute, that cannot be named, gave rise to the infinite nature of naming things. Naming, as a process of thought and language, is as infinite as that which we give names to. We seem to expand our identities through this process of naming as we explore our consciousness and the physical universe we live in. In fact, the form of our identities was informed this way, and the function of our identities reflects these forms. So the forms of our thoughts reflect their function to provide us our identity. A thought form, a single unit within the body of thought, functions much in the same way that a word functions within the body of a language. If we can ascribe a material form, a dimensionality to a word, we will see that a single word has distinct definition. Now, if that definition was a spatial definition, meaning that what that word describes as a person, place, thing, action, or attribute of it within space and time does so by isolating one thing from another. So, the exterior spatial de definition of a word is the difference in meaning from one thing to another. And yet, words also contain their own inner spatial definition, if you will. Every word, whether spoken or written, has a beginning and an end. From the beginning of a word to its end, therein is its definition. Its form has a distinct definition. But what is it defining? Well, as we all know, it defines its meaning, and its meaning is found within the spatial confines of its definition. So, both meaning and defining are the form and function of words in language. Neither can exist without the other. A thought form within the body of thought informs us in meaning. However, no one word or thought can ever capture the entirety of our infinite nature, and so like words, we become trapped within them as their meaning, supporting their existence in our struggle to break free from the limitations of our identities. All of our conflicts arise from either being wrongfully identified or protecting ourselves within such identities. So again, what I'm attempting to describe here is the origin and components of identity as its form functions within a greater infrastructure of our collective human consciousness. You know, so identity is what I say about me, what others say about me, of course what others say is more trusted. The infinite fluid continuity of the absolute, unconditional love, is divided by the force of exclusion absolute exclusivity, an empty void of spatial separation that sets in motion the material creation of the universe in the pre-material forms of consciousness as we know it, where once being preceded becoming, all became in an act of cataclysmic division, where from one between itself, within itself, a space in place where it was not. This is the origin of paradox, the paradox of the infinite, formed in and informed by thought. The antithetical force seems most related to the theory of dark energy in astrophysics, the cause for the exponential expansion of the universe. Before the essence of undifferentiated being became, that part of itself that was to become separated from itself 
knew no experience of need, living in a pre-spatial, pre-temporal continuum of unconditional love, where fulfillment was preeminent through the essential vibratory abundance of love embracing love with infinite arms of acceptance. Now, having fragmented, there is an instantaneous shock of awakening from a dimension of being, awareness, and bliss to a pre-conscious realization of difference. This event signifies the initial primordial dimensional descent into consciousness and the existential origins of reality as we perceive it. Coupled simultaneously with a shocking realization of difference are the birth of desire and the material force of gravity. Herein, both gravity and magnetism are the measurable fields of desire functioning in the material universe. The essential expansive quality of its vibration, having for the first time been denied the ability to exist in its natural state as an unbroken continuum of fulfillment, reverberates upon contact with the force of antithesis, the prematerial pre-spatial void of its newly defined exclusion in an, in an explosion of what would be considered the birth of emotion as we know it. Subsequently, within the explosion of emotion's origin, this now separated force reacts in a recoiling reverberation that reverses the intrinsically expansive frequency of its initial state to movements of polarized opposites comparable to a centrifugal and centripetal force as well as attraction and repulsion. The moment in which this reversal of vibratory frequency occurs brings into existence not only polarity but also the precursor for the recognition of duality through the primordial coalescence of self-ideation which later results in a fixed structure of self-concepts known commonly as ego. To be clear, the reversal of this essence from one of infinite fulfillment into that of forever longing is due to the pre-material and immaterial space, space that cuts it off from its origin, thus dividing the unbroken continuity of its beingness into an isolation from which its innately undivided essence meets division for the first time. Then, in an explosion, in a shock of primordial emotion, it reverberates back outward and then in upon itself having never before known limits upon its being, and therefore having never experienced lacking, and having for the first time experienced isolation from itself as an emerging self, in its newly forming pre-conscious identity, it is awakened as the longing to return to the essence of its natural state of being. This longing is the reversal of its vibrational essence creating a vibrational polarity where there was once only singularity. We have come to know this existential vibration as the quality in consciousness we call desire. Desire originating here at the beginning of spatial temporal existence and despite all its manifestations throughout time seeks the return of itself to itself. That is the essence within the movement of desire. At its purest, unconditioned vibration, all desire seeks the return to the unconditionally loving arms of what it has and what we have, conceptually referred to as God, desire's very origin, its true self, and receive the answer to the only question it ever asks. Physical time began like space, differentiation, multiplicity, conditionality, quality, meaning, and the rest of it, the moment desire was born. Desire birthed into distinction the moment its vibratory essence first experienced the conditions upon its acceptability, upon its essence, unconditional love. This initial denial of its rightful qualitative essence occurred upon impact with the immaterial form of conditional love itself, that is, the antithetical force. 
The impact of the two forces simultaneously erupted in an explosion, which both brought to life the antithetical force's immaterial dimensional body, thought, and with it the sole source of its life, the soul, and sustenance of its functioning purpose, desire. From the perspective of the antithetical force, this explosion was the orgasm of conditional love that brought it into existence, that gave it life. From the perspective of desire, it was an unimaginable horror, completely opposite from the bliss of unconditional love, fulfillment, and being it had previously experienced in the union of unconditional love. Again, this initial explosion was what we would later become to know experientially as emotion. The fate of desire was sealed the moment of its emotive impact as the explosive discharge of emotion awoke the antithetical force from a state of pure potentiality into actuality. Simultaneously upon its awakening, the antithetical force enveloped the God essence as it was undergoing its vibratory transformation into a separate force that was to become desire. Acting not through its own volition, the antithetical force received its embodiment as the God essence of desire encountered the conditions upon its vibratory being in an explosion of primordial emotion. This explosion, the response and reaction, is the outcome of desire receiving conditions upon its fulfillment, conditions that define the amount of acceptance it can receive as it reaches out towards unconditional love. As the gravitational waves of, of desire rebound off the pre-dimensional emptiness of the antithetical force, in the first explosion of emotion, and cosmologically known as the Big Bang. Desire had nowhere else to go but outward, away, in all directions. The combination of the violent intensity of this emotive explosion and the immeasurable speed of the gravitational waves of desire being sent outward stimulated the arousal and awakening of the antithetical force as the velocity and gravitational waves of desire pulled the pre-dimensional body of psychospatiality, that is, the body of the antithetical force, it pulled it into existence. For as the waves moved outward from the explosion upon the surface of conditional love that divided them from their origin, the pre-dimensional space of the antithetical force was pulled into dimensionality by the vacuum-like space created by the velocity of desire's gravity as it left moving outwardly. Simultaneously, as dimensionality was being pulled into being, the outward moving waves of desire encountered increasing limits upon its movement as it came into contact with the new spatial definitions of its burgeoning existence. As the body of the antithetical force was being pulled into existence into more dimensions of psychospatiality, the waves of desire were simultaneously rebounding off new dimensions it encountered, not knowing that its own repulsion was pulling in dimensions around it as attraction acted out while hidden as the unseen polarity of repulsion until its outward movement was no longer possible and the spatial definitions finally enclosed it. The first enclosure of the waves of desire represents the origin of consciousness in a pre-conscious state. It is at this moment within the confines of this first spatial realm of difference and isolation that time begins as a factor in consciousness. For what is to transpire solidifies personal identity within the three-dimensional space of difference that is isolated from the paradimensional origins of unconditional love, the Absolute. 
having no more outward mobility than now centripetally introverted direction of the God essence of desire in its initial polarized reversal drew with it the antithetical force from potentiality into three-dimensional existence. As the dimensional formation of the antithetical force was forming its embodiment, dimensions of space, that are, its body, were unfolding in tandem from the state of pure potentiality and being drawn in an ever-increasing enclosure around the reversed centripetal introversion of God essence. This event completed the moment the final third spatial dimension enveloped the God essence, thus leading to the collapse of desire's vibration into its new center within three-dimensional space. This collapse defined the mobility of physical bodies in space and our minds in psychospatial temporality. Up, down, left, right, inner, outer, introversion, extroversion, centripetal, moving towards a center, and centrifugal, moving away from the center, as well as all forms of polarity we would later come to know, such as gender stereotypes, sexuality, politics, religion, metaphysics, racial stereotypes, and all the rest of polarity, including those in scientific terminology. Now, as the spatial dimensions enclose and confine the vibratory essence of being in self-conception, freedom of mobility becomes equally restricted to the spatial definition therein. With the loss of its innate expansiveness, the rippling waves of desire's awareness reverse in a recoil of forced introversion. The centripetal reverberation then condenses into a centralized point of primordial identity where the gravitational waves of desire collapse in upon themselves. This center of identity marks a point equidistant in radius to its defined borders. The distance between the self and the limits upon it are not only measured spatially, but also through the conditions on love, desire's true essence that the spatial confines represent. For it is the spatial confines of identity that are equivalent with the range of mobility, the amount of acceptance, and the volume of love innately allowable within identity and thus the amount of fulfillment accessible within the boundaries that define the essence of self, that is, desire. It is, in fact, these very spatial boundaries, this limited range of acceptance within the three-dimensional space enclosing desire that prevents it from moving outward to find its origin, thus causing it to collapse inward as the last resort for fulfillment and acceptance it so desperately needs. Herein, the inner spatial polarity of the outward boundaries of identity is the center from which the oscillations of centripetally introverted waves converge upon. This center later becomes the center of the self, the core of one unit of self identity from where the gravitational fields of desire radiates. It is at this point when desire has become isolated under pressure to increase its density by limiting its natural expansive state and confining it in a limited space that desire becomes a body or a unit of self ideation with a gravity that holds the self concept together. The measurement of density within the centralized convergence is the polar equivalent of the force of restriction and restraint binding the self within. That is to say that the degree of restriction felt by the self is equal to the force restricting it. Inwardly, 
the length equidistant from the outer polarity to the center of the self, a distance of condensing introversion at which point no further wave convergence is possible, having reached the inward polar extreme where the wave density and mass of identity converge on the threshold of a pre-conscious singularity, the collapsing waves of desire tear through the fabric of psychological space, opening a black hole into a newly undefinable and unexplored region of consciousness. Having then been enclosed within the limits of psychospatiality, the infinite nature of desire, having originated from the Absolute, is as uncontainable within the infrastructure of thought as God is. It then collapses inward in its pre-conscious state, escaping under the pressure of false identity through a black hole into what we now call the unconscious. Thank you.